Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. It's time to talk about those jersey numbers again, and tonight's topic, jersey number 75. With Warren Rogan of Sports Forgotten Heroes podcast, he joins me and we'll come up with the top 10 best ever to wear jersey 75 in the NFL, and it's coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of Pigskin Dispatch. Welcome to the Pigpen once again, our bonus edition, Football by Numbers. And we are all the way up to jersey number 75. Can you believe that? We are you know, about 76% of the way through because we started with the zero and double zero. And uh, it's getting down near the end. We are in the big boys with the jersey number 75, both sides of the line. And to help us today from Sports Forgotten Heroes, it's host Warren Rogan. Warren Rogan, welcome back to the Pigpen. Hey, Darren, thanks so much for having me again. I got to ask you a question. What's that? Next summer, are we going to do college football? I mean, what are you going to do when all this runs oh, out? Boy, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to get through this one. College football, that is a, a big mountain to climb there. That's a- well, maybe you'll have to do the CFL or go back to the, <laughs> the greatest uh, number 75, whoever played in the USFL or something like that. Yeah, It'll well, be that could, it could be. It could be. We don't know which uh, way this is going to turn here. But, uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting subject, though, going to the college game. That could yeah. be very interesting. Yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine that, you know, you get, you know, particularly the running backs and the quarterbacks – you're going to have some really good debates over the greatest 32, the greatest 33, the greatest to wear seven and 12 and 14. Those would be some really good debates. Oh, yeah. You could probably do that for just certain teams and have a, a long conversation yeah. on those numbers, you know? That, Absolutely. That, yeah, that, that's a good question. I haven't really thought that far ahead. I'm just trying to get day by day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, I'm, I'm glad, uh, very happy and thrilled to be back with you to talk about 75, which yeah, I thought would be just so simple. <laughs> but like college football, man, there are a lot of greats to wear 75, both sides of the line. But I think you got to lean towards the defense here. I, I think you're absolutely right. That seems to be the more popular uh, number for the defenders. So it should be interesting. I think we're going to have a, quite a discussion here because there are some really tremendous players. Uh, I didn't realize it either until I started getting into it. I'm like, wow, there, there's some great ball players here that, that were that number. No doubt. No doubt. I mean, great ball players, Hall of Famers. Rookies of the year, defensive players of the year, all pros, names that are recognizable. I mean, it's a good list. Yeah, it definitely is. Definitely is. Well, um, I'm not sure where we want to start here. We can, I guess, mention who the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame has on their list that were number 75. And then maybe. Yeah, yeah. You want to go through that first? Sure. uh, Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they have seven players uh, that the Pro Football Hall of Fame recognizes. Uh, and it's Joe Green, Deacon Jones, 
Gino Marchetti, Winston Hill, Howie Long, Jonathan Ogden, and Forrest Gregg. You know, those, those seven names right there are tremendous in uh, any list that you'd put together. And I'm not even sure that uh, all of those guys will, will make this top 10 list because there's some great players that aren't even in the Hall of Fame yet. Oh, sure. I mean, Vince Wilfork's on this list. Jethro Pugh. I mean, um, Chris Hinton. Jim Cat Cavage. There's some really, really great names on here. Uh, you know, you just go down. Tony Casillas, Irv Panky. Um, yeah, there's some. You look at this list and you go, who am I going to? Who am I going to leave off? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I had the same, same reactions to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll do this any which way you want to go. I'll go number one to 10, number uh, 10 up to one, however you want to do it. I actually got, um, uh, I put together three, you know, a couple of, uh, couple of guys I thought should be on the list, but aren't on the list. Um, you know, however you want to do it. Well, why don't, why don't we, uh, you and I, before we've done it, we've, uh, compared our top 10 lists and then we sort of gone from there. How about, okay. how about we do that? All right. So my number one might not sit well with Steeler fans. Um, but my number one, I don't see how you can go against it is Deacon Jones. I mean, Deacon Jones was the greatest number 75. It's pretty, pretty hard to say no to Deacon. And I got um, my number two. There's your Steeler, Mean Joe Green. Okay. My, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I have them one and two also, but in the opposite order. I'm, I'm a I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. The man, You're changed, the man changed a franchise. You know, one winning season in their first four decades, Joe Green comes on. Uh, they had a losing season his first season, but then everything turned around. I think he was the, the pivotal key that sort of changed the momentum of that franchise. That's why I put him there. Yeah, no no doubt. But I, I, I went back and looked at, you know, the numbers, the pure numbers. And I do make an argument that that Green could be number one. I mean, the guys he played with on the steel curtain, you know, takes away some of what he might have been able to do because he sort of had to share, you know. But but Warren, he, he gave a, a kid his jersey <laughs> for a Coke. You know, how, how can you not give him number one? Come on. Yeah. Warren, come on. Yeah. But Deacon Jones liked it less. Was Deacon in those commercials? You know? Yeah. Um, um, I got Gino Marchetti at, at number three. Okay. Howie Long at number four. All right. Winston Hill is my number five. The guy was an absolute stud. Forrest Gregg at number six. Jim Cat Cavage, number seven. Jonathan Ogden, number eight. Manny Fernandez, number nine. And probably the one that I could see you say, no way, but I just remember him destroying my Giants time and time again, Jethro Pugh. Okay. Very similar, very similar. You know, I, I have uh, Green number one, Deacon Jones number two, and I uh, then jump down to also have uh, Marchetti as uh, number three, and then I go Howie Long, Jonathan Ogden, uh, Winston Hill, uh, Forrest Gregg. I went with Vince Woolfork, I think is one of our differences. Uh, I also put Jim Cat Cavich and Jethro Pugh to, to round it out. So, wow. Very interesting. Yeah. So very we only had one different. I, yeah, I had I had, uh, and, yeah. You had Will Fork and I have Manny Fernandez. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not that familiar with them. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about Manny Fernandez. Okay. I changed my mind. All right. We'll get that way. So uh, you want to do it the way I've been going? We'll start with number 10. Sure. That sounds great. All right, we'll work our way back up. Okay. Not a lot there, but I, I remember Jethro Pugh 
on those cowboy teams destroying my giants as a kid growing up. And, um, you know, the, the dude was big, six foot six, played on the Cowboys from 65 to 78, had, you know, 90 something sacks. And I think like Joe Green, he had to share the spotlight. But in in Pew's way, he he was he was one of the ones that didn't get the recognition that, you know, Ed Tutal Jones got, you know, Bob Lilly, guys like that. When you think of the steel curtain with the Steelers, Joe Green was the one that got most of the recognition. Well, I think Pew played in the shadow of some of these other guys. Pretty tough to play in the shadow of someone when you're six foot six. Yeah. Um, I, how, how about the size of that uh, defensive line for the Cowboys back in that era? You know, uh, Gil Brandt and Tom Landry just loved to have those those oh. big, tall guys, you know, and Pew might have been the shortest of them. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm what, not sure what, how tall, what, tall Lily was, but uh, what, what were they called? The doomsday defense or something like yes, that? And, yes. And and they doomed my Giants. They doomed a lot of teams back then, you know. He played on two of those Super Bowl champions with the Cowboys in the early 70s. Yeah, he was only a two-time second-team All-Pro. And while that might not sound all that impressive, he was was part of a team that that was tough to, to gain all that recognition. So he had to share the spotlight. And then, you know, there were other great players in the league at that time, too. And, you know, you can't you can't overlook the fact he had 96 and a half sacks and he led the doomsday defense. Those cowboy teams from 1968 through 72, he led them in sacks each year and in just 13 games in 1968. He had 15 and a half sacks. He he made my list at number 10. Yeah, I had the exact same reasons. And I can remember him as a player myself. You know, uh, remember that he played on the two Cowboys teams that lost by four points to the Steelers, too. They could have very easily had two more Super Bowl wins, but they were very yeah. evenly matched uh, with the Steelers of the 70s. And, you know, and you throw the Raiders in there. But uh, Jethro Pugh, was, he was a significant part of that defensive line. It wasn't all Ed Tutal Jones and and Lilly and uh, you know the the linebacking core. Uh, that that front uh, three or four that I can't remember which defense they played. They were tough, and Jethro Pugh was a, a one of the tough hombres on that defense. You could sure. run against them, and like you said, they were big. It was tough to throw against them. They were. They were the doomsday defense. Gosh darn it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, how does a quarterback find a, a passing window when you have these arms, you know, you know, seven and a half feet in the air, you know, by the time you have their arm length on there, that's just as crazy. Uh, yeah. You got to yeah. get those, uh, those offensive linemen, get those hands down. You got to chop, chop. Yeah. <laughs> that's for yeah. sure. No doubt. So Darren, my number nine was Manny Fernandez. And, and you said, um, you, you don't know a whole lot about him. And, and, and really, that fits the bill. He was part of the Dolphins' no-name defense that ah, went okay. undefeated. He was one of the stars of that defense. He, I, I never even knew, while researching for this episode, I never even knew there was such an award as – the unsung player of the year, but 1973, he was the NFL's unsung player of the year. Like Pew, he was a two-time second team all pro, but again, he was part of a defense that, well, shucks, they went to three straight Super Bowls, you know, and they won two of them. Um, he was all AFC in 1971. They had an all AFC team and an all NFC team. He was twice. He was second team all AFC in his three Super Bowl appearances. Remember, the Dolphins lost 24 to three. 
Then they won. They beat the Redskins 14 to seven. And then they beat the Vikings. I forget the score of that game, but they lost to, I believe it was the Cowboys and they beat the Redskins for the undefeated season. And they beat the Vikings. He was a nose tackle in his three Super Bowl appearances. He had 28 tackles and three sacks, 35 career sacks for a nose tackle. Nose tackles aren't really known for sacking the quarterback. And he did a pretty good job. Nick Bonacanti, the fav- the famous Nick Bonacanti, mm-hmm. um, thought that Manny should have been the MVP in Super Bowl Seven. In that game alone, that in that undefeated season, and in that game against the Redskins, he had 17 tackles. Wow. Um, he's on the Dolphins' all-time team considered to be one of the greatest Super Bowl players of all time. He's in the Dolphins Ring of Honor 2014. I, I, you know, no-name defense. You're a huge football fan, not all that familiar with his name, and that fits the bill, and I think he's one of the top 75s of all time. Okay. I mean, you make a very compelling case for him. I, uh, I'm going to take that under consideration here. All because right, I, because you're right. I when I think of those Dolphins teams, the the last thing I think about is their defense. I'm I'm offensive minded. I'm thinking that uh, that uh, three headed uh, backfield that they had. You know, I'm thinking of sure. Greasy. I'm thinking, you know, sure. Bob Greasy was the quarterback in that game. But go back through the record books. Who was the quarterback that won most of the games that year for the Dolphins? It wasn't. Bob Greasy, it was Earl Morrill, and he had a rough time in the playoffs, and Greasy came on and relieved him, and certainly Greasy had a phenomenal career, a, a great season, those games that he did play. But you, like you said, the three-headed monster, who was it yet? Zonka, Kick, and Warfield. I mean, what a backfield. Well, I'm, I'm thinking even Mercury Morris and, and Mercury Matthew. Morris. Yeah, yeah. Warfield. Yeah, he's he's another you know outstanding one. I didn't even I failed to mention, but yeah, that's uh, they, they were a running game. They were power running, and uh, you know, like everybody was back then. And the passing was just supplemented the run, uh, it, unlike it, it is today. Yeah, it really truly only supplemented the run. Um, greasy threw the ball 11 times for 88 yards in the whole game. They were, they were a running team. Um, yeah, they just, they were just, uh, and they, they went up against a heck, a heck of a, uh, Redskins team in that game. And, um, you know, yeah, Zonka had 112 yards, kick had 38, Mercury Morris had 34. You're right. Warfield, Warfield was more, um, I, you know, the receiver. He had three receptions for 36 yards. But uh, Manny Fernandez, yeah, he was um, he was a stud. Yeah, 17 stud. tackles you said he had in the one Super Bowl? Well, that's, <laughs> that's what I read. That's what I read. But um, as I'm looking at stats now, it says he had six tackles. So, and he had a sack. So, I, you know. It depends on depends on who you who who you believe. But now I'm on a Pro Football Reference. He still had six tackles. Nick Bonacani said that that guy should have been the Super Bowl MVP, and that's good enough for me. Yeah, but just think about what you said earlier. In the three Super Bowls, you know, one loss and two wins, you said he had 28 tackles. Yeah, for a nose tackle. That's pretty substantial. Yes, you'll yep. see that. Uh, very often, you know, you have 60 plays and that's what averaging nine, nine tackles a game in those 60 plays. Not bad. Yeah, exactly. Not bad. Exactly. Okay. You got me thinking right. about, about Manny Fernandez now. And who is your, who, who is your number 10 and your number nine? I, for number 10, I had Jethro Pugh, just like you did. And I okay. ended up having, um, uh, let's see here. Oh, I changed, uh, I had Jim Katkavich as my number nine. Okay. I have Katkavich up a little bit higher. Um, and uh, we could talk about him. So who's the one player that we had different? I, I had Will Fork at number eight. Oh, Vince Will Fork. Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, 
anchor of those great Patriot teams. Yeah, so I, I swapped you a nose tackle for a nose tackle, basically. There you go. There you go. <laughs> My number eight, Jonathan Ogden. And, you know, we've had this discussion before. It is just so hard to measure statistically an offensive lineman versus a defensive lineman because defensive linemen get the tackles, they get the sacks, interceptions, they fumble, you know, recoveries, whereas the offensive lineman is backpedaling most of the time protecting the quarterback. But as a back peddler, hardly anyone ever did it better than Ogden. Uh, Named to the Hall of Fame in 2013, four-time first-team All-Pro, five times he was a second-team All-Pro, 11 times he made the Pro Bowl. He was all-decade for the NFL for the 2000s, the NFL's 100th anniversary team. He's in the Raver, Ravens, the Ravens Ring of Honor, um, Offensive Lineman of the Year in 2002. He played in 177 games over the course of his career, and he started 176 of them. That's pretty good. And um, he was actually a pretty darn good athlete um, outside of football as well. He was an All-American in track and field. He threw the discus, and he threw the shot put in high school and was a high school All-American. So, or all America. So he is my number eight. And, you know, he was an anchor on some very, very good Baltimore Raven teams. Yeah. Well, how you, you'd like to talk about Jethro Pugh destroying your team. Well, this man was a wrecking crew to, to my ah. sack masters of the Steelers. I mean, he matched up against Greg Lloyd, you know, early in his career. And Greg, Greg Lloyd was, you know, at the height of his career in the, the mid nineties. And when he came sure. in, uh, he shut down, you know, Lamar Woodley, who had a, a great uh, Steelers career there for a few years. Uh, you know, James Harrison, he played against, uh, you know, some of the all time great Steelers uh, edge rushers, Jonathan Ogden was just a, a wall to protect those quarterbacks for the Ravens. And it, it drove us crazy in Pittsburgh. You know, we, we, we hated him, <laughs> but uh, he was a great player. You can't take it away. He from was him. a wall by himself. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for yeah. sure. I mean, to be a man that big and to have such quick footwork and great hands, uh, it was amazing. He, he was truly an athlete at you know, six foot nine, 345 pounds. He was a big dancing bear. That's what he was. And uh, people couldn't get around him very easily. No, sure. yeah, no doubt. I mean, he, he, um, he was, um, uh, uh, he was, when you would play the Ravens, he's one of the guys you would think about, you know, Absolutely. you thought about Ray Lewis, you thought about Jonathan Ogden. Those were the big names on that team. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. Yep. And, and he was respected around the league. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, everybody knew you know, he was, uh, I put him right up there with like a Joe Thomas, you know, that uh, just uh, sealed off that left side of the line and quarterbacks felt very comfortable with, with those guys on their, on their left side. And uh, who wouldn't be if you have some great athletes like that. So Jonathan Absolutely. Ogden. Yeah, I agree. He's on my list also. And I had him, uh, I, I had, had him number five. I had him number five. Right, right. You had him higher. I also have an offensive lineman at number five, just a different offensive lineman. Okay. <laughs> right. well, let's go to your uh, number seven. My number seven is Jim Cat Cabbage. And I remember my father telling me stories about Jim Cat Cabbage. And um, okay, so he played for the Giants, but he deserves to be there. The guy... Yeah, he played defensive end, defensive tackle. He was pretty big, you know, for back then. He was six foot three, 237. He came up to the Giants in 56. And his first four years, even as uh, statisticians go back and start compiling statistics like sacks, they, they haven't gone back beyond 1960. So his first four years, there are no statistics for sacks. 
So they start counting sacks as of right now from 1960 and forward. So in his in his um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine last seasons. So from 1960 through 1968, he had 91 and a half sacks. Remember, it was only a 14 game season. It wasn't a 16 game season when he played. And actually when he started, it was only a 12 game season. And it's not a 17 game season like what we're about to go now. So in a 14 game season in 1962, he led the NFL in sacks with 16. In a 14 game season, In 1963, he led the NFL in sacks with 20 and a half. Heck, in a 16-game season, 20 and a half is really impressive. So is 16. Um, He was, he had three safeties over the course of his career, uh, one interception. He was a three-time first-team All-Pro Twice, he was second-team All-Pro. Like I said, twice, he led the NFL in sacks. He helped the Giants to the NFL championship. There was no Super Bowl. He helped the Giants to the NFL championship in 1956. And you and I had this discussion, I think it was about Bubba Baker, and why is he not in the Hall of Fame? Well, I sit here and scratch my head wondering why Jim Cat Cabbage isn't in the Hall of Fame. He is in the PFRA's Hall of Very Good. I I really wonder why a guy who twice led the NFL in sacks in 14-game seasons, he had 16 and 20 and a half, 91 and a half for his career, helped a team to an NFL championship, was a three-time first-team All-Pro. I I don't get why he's not in the hall. He was good. He was really good. Well, well, let me compound your frustration, because I agree with you. When He he has 20 and a half sacks in 1963, 16 in 1962, 14 game seasons. The percentage of run to pass is nowhere near, like we just discussed a few minutes ago, nowhere near what it is today. Yeah. You know, in 60 average plays, it's not 50-50 run and pass like it is sometimes in games today or more leaning towards a pass. It was probably, you know, I would say probably 75% of the time you are running the ball. So your opportunity for sacks dwindles. And the man had 20 and a half and that, that amount of opportunities. I mean, that's phenomenal. And, uh, yeah, why he's not in the Hall of Fame, that's a that's a great question, but uh, just like Bubba Baker, we talked about. You're right; he, the man should be in the Hall of Fame. And uh, you know, I'm I'm not a Giants fan, but my father-in-law, uh, who's no longer with us, he was, and he, you know, he lived in Vermont. The Giants used to have their spring training up in Vermont, very close to his house. That's how he became a, a, such a Giants fan. And he raved about this man. It, two two guys that he loved as giants he loved cat cabbage and he loved sam huff you know two uh yeah. right, two of the the best defenders they ever had you know the other side of lt so yeah i i definitely is on this list and uh should be in the hall of fame too i agree totally agree i you know i guess like in um every sport you get those that are overlooked and he's one of those guys that's 100 percent overlooked well maybe uh, with the, you know, I just came, came from hall of fame weekend in Canton this weekend. You know, we had the class of 2020, they, that centennial class, they brought in a lot of those, uh, those older players, uh, that deservedly so, uh, including one we're going to be talking about here in a few minutes. Um, maybe possibly they'll expand that in the future and have some more big, large classes like that and bring in some of these, these guys that are very deserving. So who yeah. knows, maybe we can get yeah, some of these guys in. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Well, my number six is a player and a coach, Forrest Gregg. What a life in football that guy had. 
uh, played 15 years. He only missed one season during his playing days. That was 1957 because of military obligations. Um, he was a solid tackle with the Packers. Um, at one point, from what I read, he played in a then NFL record 188 straight games. And he wasn't playing for some little old diddly squat coach. He was playing for Vince Lombardi. And Lombardi once said that Forrest Gregg was the finest football player he ever coached. That's, that's pretty high praise. Um, as a player, he was elected into the Hall of Fame. In 1977, he played on three teams that won a Super Bowl. He played on Super Bowl one and two with the Packers and Super Bowl six, the team that beat the Dolphins 24 to three. He didn't have a whole lot of playing time with the Cowboys back then, but he had a lot of playing time in Super Bowls one and two. He was also part of a Packers team that won the NFL championship in 61, 62, 65, 66, 67. Of course, those last two were Super Bowl years as well. Nine times Pro Bowl. Seven times he was a first-team All-Pro. Twice he was a second-team All-Pro. Um, he was named to the NFL anniversary teams, the 50th anniversary team, the 75th anniversary team. And he was a 1960s all decade team. Now to me, the really interesting thing about Forrest Gregg is his sack total. I find it very interesting. Um, you know, this guy was, was um, he's a Hall of Famer, and he played. He played well. He, he split time on both sides of the line, but he never ever had a sack. But he split time on both sides of the line. I thought he would he would have uh, at least a couple of sacks. Um, then he became a coach. Now, as much as he split time on both sides of the ball and the fact that he never had a sack, he made up for it by being named coach of the year, his first year as a coach with the Browns, and they went 3-11, and and he was coach of the year. So go figure <laughs> that out. They made it up for him. And he also coached the Bengals and he coached the Packers. His career record was 75 wins, 85 losses, and a tie. But he lived a life in football. And if he wasn't coaching or playing in the NFL, he found himself coaching in the CFL. He found himself, uh, he was the coach for one season with the Toronto Argonauts. He also coached in the CFL when it tried to make it here in the U S and he coached for a team called the Shreveport pirates. And uh, he went eight and 28 with them. So he had a lot more success as a player than he did as a coach. Yeah, he did. Now, did he coach the, the Bengals the first time that they played uh, Joe Montana and the 49ers and lost him? I, Super Bowl? um, I think he did. I think he coached the first time and Sam Weish was the second time the Bengals met the Niners yeah. and lost. Yeah. So, so yeah, so he's a Super Bowl coach, you know. Yeah, he uh and and you know, he could have he could have he could have won that game. Yeah, that was a year that um the Bengals went 12 and 4. Kenny Anderson was their quarterback. Mm -hmm. Uh they won the AFC Championship that year and you know, that was the beginning of the 49er dynasty. Yeah, that, that really game really put them on the map that season did. That's for sure. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree with everything that you say. Uh, again, a little bit surprised with the sack total. Uh, you know, I think, and by, by the way, the sack totals uh, that we get from 1960 season up to the 1981 season, 
just happened about a month ago. And that was uh, the work of John Turney and Nick Webster. So no kudos to them uh, yeah. from the uh, pro football journal. Uh, and they got on the uh, pro football reference website. So, you know, great stats and a lot of work, uh, 30 years of work. It took them to, to get that. Um, but, you know, again, I think it's the era that Forrest Gregg played, uh, you know, and he was a two-way player uh, teams ran the ball and it wasn't his job to be a penetrator. He, he was, his job was to plug holes and, uh, you know, block, you know, take out running lanes. So the runners can't have to go outside and you know get to the backers. So, and that, that was a successful defense that the, the Packers ran. So, yeah, it's not the, the the flashy statistics of the sack and the tackles for loss, but he did his job. You know, he he held his own on the line. Both yeah, sides of the ball. yeah, he did. He did what he had to do to help the Packers win, and they won a lot. That that's for sure. That's for sure. I mean, think about the the big games that that man was either on the field or on the sideline for. You know. All those Packers championship games, and even I think they they lost one or two during his run uh, there. Also, here in the championship game, um, you know, being on the Dallas uh, uh, team when they, they were won a Super Bowl, the um, uh, times with the Bengals that we talked about, and the Browns, uh, just just some some big games and uh, a great player, great coach, yeah, great like uh, said, great name in football history. Yeah, like I said, a football lifer, a true football lifer. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. So, yeah, I, I have him on the list also, and I have him at – you have him at six, I have him at seven. So, pretty, okay. pretty, even, pretty right. even there. Okay, well, who who's your five? My number five is Winston Hill. Now, Winston Hill, he um was – well, you were there. He mm-hmm. was elected into the hall this past weekend – um, I think an honor long overdue, 100% not nearly as well known as Ogden. And, you know, maybe Ogden should be number five and Hill could be number eight. But I also looked at it from the standpoint of he was, I think he was, boy, overlooked too. We have a couple of overlooked people on this list. He started and played in every game for the Jets for 12 straight years, um, 174 straight starts. He was the anchor of the Jets' offensive line during his day there, protecting to the best that he could Joe Namath. Um, and he was an anchor on that line in the famous Super Bowl three when the Jets upset the Colts. He played most of his career in the AFL before, you know, the AFL was absorbed into the NFL. Maybe it was a 50-50 split. Um, Four times he was at that. The the AFL didn't have all pro. They had the all-stars. So he was a four-time AFL all-star. Three times he was all AFL. Four times after his AFL days and they became a member of the NFL, he was on the Pro Bowl team four times. He is on the AFL's all AFL second team, all time second team, Jets ring of honor. Um, The interesting thing is he was drafted by the Colts, but, you know, you had those wars back then between the NFL and AFL drafted by the Colts elected to play for the Jets. And um, again, very difficult to judge offensive linemen, even against each other when you're talking about that level of greatness and very difficult to judge against defensive linemen who put up incredible numbers. But I think Winston Hill is deserving. Heck, he was deserving of being in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Most definitely. Now, they had a real nice tribute. You know, unfortunately, we, we lost uh, Winston about five years ago, 2016. So he didn't get to see his name or you know, have David Baker call him on the phone or anything. Uh, but it was a thrill for his family, I'm sure. And they did not have the family on the stage at the ceremonies uh, Saturday evening for the 2020 class. 
but they did have a, a real nice uh, video of him. Uh, Joe Namath you know, speaking very highly of him, a Hall of Famer himself, uh, you know, said how pivotal he was to that uh, Jets offense that uh, you know, won Super Bowl three. You know, how uh, sort of ironic that the, the team that he won the Super Bowl three over was the team that drafted him, like you yeah. said, in the 11th yeah. round. Uh, but when he retired, he had the Jets record for the most uh, career games at 195. And as an offensive lineman, that's a lot. I mean, that, that's a yeah. lot today for an offensive lineman. To, that's, uh, you know, really a lot of run blocking in, in his case, too. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think very deservedly so. He, he he's on that list and is in the Hall of Fame. And I, I'm happy for his family that they uh, finally get to see that honor and have his bronze bust in Canton. Yep, no doubt. I agree with you. I think Winston Hill is most deserving of being in our top 10 list of the greatest ever to wear 75. Most definitely. Okay, I think uh, we have the same uh, number four. Yeah, Howie Long. I mean, you know, what, 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 what everybody knows Howie Long. Everybody who's listening to this podcast knows who Howie Long is. So I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on Howie, mm -hmm. but you know, he was, he was a great one. Eight times. He was in the pro bowl three time, first team, all pro second time, second team, all pro. He was the NFL's uh, defensive player of the year in 1985, 1980s all decade team he was elected into the hall in the year 2000. 91 and a half career sacks. He had a career high of 13 in 1983 and he played in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 18. Yeah. And definitely you know, check all those boxes. He's, <laughs> yeah. He's, he's entertaining to watch on, uh, on the uh, Fox NFL pregame show too. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of remarkable how much uh, the man smiles and has a good time now. And then you, you watch back his football footage and remember back to him playing. I mean, he was just a snarling, growling, uh, you know, animal uh, for that defensive line of the Raiders. You know, he, he struck fear and terror into everybody in the backfield and probably the offensive lines of his opposition. Uh, you sure. know, what, what a beast this guy was. A great player. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, now my number three, interestingly enough, like you said, our, our top four are almost identical. We flip flop one and two, but we had the same number three. And I think most football fans have probably heard the name Gino Marchetti, but I'm not sure, um, everyone knows a whole lot about him. And he's one of those guys, again, could have been overshadowed. Um, he, he played for the Colts from 1952 through 1964. And, and he, he missed the 65 season, came back for a couple of games in 66. And like we talked about earlier, they have traced sacks back through the 1960 season. So, in the five years that he did play that they have traced sacks back to, and I guess I, 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 I put a lot of, a lot of emphasis on sacks in this list. Um, he had 56 in those five years. So a little more than 11 a year. Um, he had 11 in 1960 and that's when they only played 12 games um, career high in, of 13 when they expanded to the 14 game season in 1961. He was with the Colts when they won the championship in 58 and 59. Nine times he was a first team all pro. He was once a second team all pro. 11 times he was a pro bowler. 1950s all decade team. He was on the NFL's 50th, 75th, and 100th anniversary teams. Now, he only wore 75 for a couple of four years in 89, the other years. And the 89, by the way, is retired 
by the Colts. And he is actually, because of all the time he spent in Baltimore, he's actually in the Ravens ring of honor, despite the fact he never played for the Ravens. Um, in that famous, famous 1958 NFL championship game against the Giants on a very crucial third down play, he stopped Frank Gifford. Um, and he actually broke his ankle on the play. Opposing coach Sid Gilman from the Rams said Marchetti was the greatest player in football. Forrest Gregg, who we talked about earlier, called him the best all-around player he ever played against. So a lot of high praise, a lot of great stats. One interesting fact, his first year was with the Colts, but not with the Colts. The Colts actually were the Dallas Texans his first year. And most people think that the Dallas Cowboys are the first team to call Dallas home in the NFL. Actually, there was a team before them and before the Kansas City Chiefs, who were the original Houston Texans, there were the Dallas Texans. They played for one year, 1952. Yeah, the, the, the first uh, generation Dallas Texans, uh, like you said, Kansas City Chiefs were the second uh, era of the Dallas Texans coming in, uh, but that was in the AFL. So, mm-hmm. yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, I, I think you know, Marchetti, you know, like I said, my, my father-in-law, I vividly remember he was, you know, he was ill. And that's when they did the colorization of the greatest game ever played. Uh, it was a, probably five or six years ago. And we, we watched that game together. I went over there. I knew it was a big deal for him. We got it tuned into his, his hospital room and got it watching it. And I can just remember, you know, it seemed like it was every play. You know, Gino Marchetti on the stop. Gino Marchetti. This. Gino Marchetti. <laughs> you know, you, you know, he was that significant. And that's, you know, midway through his career. And, uh, you know, I, I never watched him play live, but I did watch that game and I've watched, you know, a lot of highlights of him and read a lot about him. And yeah, he was a beast and uh, d- deservedly so to be this high on the list, I, I feel. So yeah. I'm glad we're in agreement on that. Yeah. All right. So here's where we get into our disagreement. <laughs> so I have Joe Green number two. Two, and I'm hoping you might be able to answer a question for me as I go through this. Okay. Um, well, first of all, he played for the Steel Curtain defense of the mid '70s, and you know they were as brutal, as tough as any defense I think in the history of the NFL. And they had so many good players on that team. You know, his stats might not be as impressive as one might think, but the Steelers were so good. Offenses had to pick their poison as to who they were going to attack on the defense. And most of the time they chose to attack Joe Green. Um, But still he was fast, quick, tough, impossible to run against and and here's where this is not a knock against him this is what this is the fact this hurts him they were so you know who else was on that team you had uh elsie uh, greenwood elsie greenwood ernie and, holmes uh, ernie white, Hol- white, white. who uh, Dwight White and uh, Ernie Holmes. Or... I'm thinking of the uh, another guy, Lambert, Jack Lambert, oh, Jack, Jack Lambert, Jack Ham, right. backers. Yeah. yeah. Um. So Joe only had 77 and a half sacks over the course of his career, but it's because he had a split all. You had all these other guys there, and and Joe was the focus of the offense is to keep him away from the quarterback. In 1972, he had 11 sacks. That was his best. Um, twice he was the defensive player of the year, 72 and 74. He was a defensive rookie of the year in 69. And you alluded to the fact that the Steelers were really a stinky team when he first came up, but you know, they were Chuck Knoll was putting together one heck of a roster. He was the NFL 
Man of the Year in 79. Five times he was a first-team All-Pro. Three times he was a second-team All-Pro. Ten times Pro Bowl. NFL 75th and 100th anniversary teams. His number 75 is retired. Now, I have a question for you. I wanted to know where the name Mean Joe Green came from. So I did some research okay. and I found that, you know, he played at North Texas State. And when he got there, according to what I saw, the team was actually the North Texas State Eagles. Although it can't be 100% verified, the story I heard goes something like this. They renamed the team the Mean Green either during his sophomore or junior year, or no, it was during his freshman year. They renamed the team the Mean Green, and he made this brutal tackle, and someone blurts out, that's the way, Mean Green, meaning Mean Green as in the Mean Green team, but it stuck with him because his name was Green. So he became... Mean Joe Green. And here's my question for you. Unless I'm just not seeing this and keep overlooking it, where does the name Joe come from? His birth given name is Charles Edward Green. So where does Joe come from? That that I don't know. Uh, but I know he went by Joe Green in college. Uh, I, I've never heard him called Charles Green. And I, I've heard a similar story. Matter of fact, on the uh, the tradition, uh, the, the Mean Greens re- sports.com, the uh, North Texas uh, sports page of, of the college, they, they say that there was a lady named Sydney Sue Graham that went to the, one of the games in North Texas State had a, you know, they had a brutal defense and Joe Green was, was part of that. And they were losing to one of their rivals, which was uh, Texas Western College, who's now the University of Texas, El Paso. Uh, they were losing to them and uh, everybody was extremely surprised. So th- this lady, Sydney Sue Graham, started yelling out because their colors were green for just like the Philadelphia Eagles are green, the uh, North Texas Eagles were green. And she's like, Come on, come on, Green, get mean, Green, get mean. And like you said, Joe Green had a, a big play shortly after she said that, and the name stuck to him. And he didn't like that name. I mean, every no, time, no, yeah, he, he you're said, right. He, said, he didn't like that name. He said, he's "I'm actually, a nice guy. I don't know why everybody calls me yeah, mean." He's actually a docile guy. He's he doesn't. He's not a mean person, right? Uh, but on a football field, I can see where people could because uh, he played nasty. He. <laughs> He uh, didn't take much baloney from anybody and he did his job and was very effective. Um, I can, I can think of the play, some plays in Super Bowl nine Steelers against the Vikings, you know, the scrambler, uh, Fran Tarkington, uh, that, that poor guy, there was a couple of plays. He didn't know where to go and he had no escape routes because you had, you know, green coming up field, uh, you know, they Steelers, you know, even though they're known as a blitzing team, the last like, three, four decades back then their front four took care of all the pressure. They didn't have to send the linebackers very often. Um, the linebackers could, that's why Jack Lambert, Jack Ham had so many interceptions. They could drop back and pass coverage during passing plays because that front four would put so much pressure on the offense uh, line and throw the timing off of any quarterback, even great ones like Fran Tarkington. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm like I said. I'm a homer. Deacon Jones could very easily go number one. Uh, Joe Green's one of my idols. You know, I yeah. I, I can't. Uh, he's probably probably in my mind probably the greatest Steeler that's that's ever played the game because he changed be. that franchise. Yeah, that's how I felt about uh, LT. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. he changed the fortune of the Giants franchise, and um, you know there aren't as many great number fifty sixes. Uh, to compare against LT, but I got to tell you, there's a great number 75 to compare against Joe Green. The one area that without a doubt, Joe Green has the edge on Deacon Jones is postseason performance. Joe Green played in what, you know, 
15, 18 playoff games. Deacon Jones, I think, played in three. Do I hold that against Deacon Jones? Uh, not really, um, because football is a team game. And you, as a, as, a, as a defensive end, you can't control what your offense is doing. If you got a stinky offense on your, you know, you're playing with a team with a stinky offense, you're not making the playoffs. It's, it's as easy as that, no matter how good your defense is. But, you know, I listen, I read, I listen, I analyze stats to the best of my ability. And I just think it's really hard not to say, um, you know, or at least make a heck of an argument that Deacon Jones is the greatest to ever wear 75. He played, um, you know, for 14 years, mostly with the Rams, played a tiny bit with San Diego and a, and a tiny bit with, with the Redskins or the Washington football team now. 173 and a half sacks. So we had almost a hundred more than Joe did. Um, five times he led the NFL in sacks. And this is during a 14 game season. He had uh, from, from 1964 through 1969, 22, 19, 16, 21 and a half, 22, 15. You could not beat this guy. You could not run the ball around him. You couldn't throw around him. Twice he had 22 sacks in a season. Once he missed 22 by a half a sack. And again, it was only 14 games a year. Played in the Pro Bowl eight times. Five times he was first team all pro. Explain to me on the nine other occasions who beat him out? How was that even possible? Um, three times he was a second team all pro. Twice he was the defensive player of the year. 75th and 100th NFL anniversary teams. The 1960s all decade team. His number 75 retired by the Rams. Off the field, one heck of a civil rights activist. In fact, he went to South Carolina State and they pulled his scholarship when they found out that he was part of some civil rights movements, um, you know, and um, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, he, he was as tough as it gets. And the guy was big, man. He was 6'5", 272. Yeah, I, I mean, I... I Points well taken, uh, but again, you know, if, if we're comparing them, I think, you know, Joe Green, if you look at his, he had 77 and a half sacks, I think, uh, yeah. I think almost 40 of those were in his first four years, uh, 1972 being his fourth season. And that's the year that Jack Lambert came in, uh, Donnie Shell, uh, some of those other great Steelers defenders. And I think he relinquished his own statistics to play more of a team defense. And, and my argument is the four Super Bowl rings because of him doing it, that. It, it's, it's, it's a great argument. I mean, maybe, maybe they're one and one. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, it's, it's a fun argument and there's yeah. no right answer to it. That's the yeah, beauty of it. We're, 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 we're splitting the hairs here. Right. I, um, and if we had to measure by postseason experience, no doubt. Out, Joe Green is number one, no doubt. Um, I I just I look at the films, how brutal Deacon Jones was too. I mean, it's just yeah, you know, splitting hairs, and um, could easily make the argument that Joe Green is number one. That, no, did uh, was Deacon Jones was he part of that uh, fearsome foursome, or is that be after him? No, I think that was with him, right? That was with uh, Merlin Olson uh, and Merlin Olson, and um, gosh, who who were the, who were the four? Uh, 
I, I think he might have been part of them. So, you know, he did have some great teammates and to have uh, that, uh, that many sacks. And that's, that's unbelievable too. Uh, Rosie Greer, Merlin Olson, Deacon Jones, and Lamar Lundy. That's right. Okay. So, yeah, he was a member of that. And to have that many sacks, you know, <laughs> those other guys, uh, their, their sack totals weren't too far behind them, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. No, they were. That defense was crazy good. It just had no offense at that time. They couldn't They couldn't uh, win a playoff game. They couldn't get yeah. into the playoffs. Yeah. Probably maybe they had a little bit of trouble in the back end, too, of the defense. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. But yeah, I, I, it's a fun argument. I think, yeah, like you say, they're one, one, a, you know, however you want to shake it. If you're number two on that list, that's still pretty darn good too. So yeah, no either doubt. Either way you shake it there. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's a great top 10 that we have there. Now one player that I had that you didn't is Vince Wil- Wilfork. And yeah. Uh, tell us about Vince. Well, you know, most famously, you know, he's that middle, uh, Nose tackle, you know, the, the plugger that Bill Belichick always liked, you know, of that, uh, those great uh, New England Patriots teams of, you know, the 2004, he came into the league, uh, stayed with the Patriots all the way to 2014, uh, the, you know, two Super Bowl championships, which is a little bit surprising during that whole era because he played basically he came in the same year or year after Tom Brady did, uh, but, you know, five Pro Bowls, uh, one all pro, um, and, you know, he played in a couple other Super Bowls that your Giants took him out in. And, yeah. Uh, then he left and uh, went, went to Houston for a couple of years after that, 2015, 2016, before he retired. And uh, for his sacks, uh, you know, kind of surprising, you know, only 16. But like we said earlier, yeah, nose tackles aren't known for, tackle. yeah. they, they aren't known for, you know, penetrating. They're known for plugging the A-gap. That's their job. You <laughs> know, Make life miserable, make things go outside and uh, let the fast guys catch them. So uh, that's why I put him on there. I just think he was that significant of a player. And I'm not sure that New England's defense would have been as good without him in the middle. No doubt. He was a big dude, really wide, big. And again, for his size, man, he could move. Right. And he, I mean, he opened up lanes for the the linebackers and like uh, Tony Bruschi and and some of those other guys to uh, make plays. And well, he ate up blocks because he was that big of a guy. And it took two men to block him. So I just think he's that significant of a player. That's why I put him on the list. But mm-hmm. you, you're yeah. very convincing, yeah. uh, you know, with talking about Manny. So I, I might change my mind on that. You might have convinced me. Well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, I just look at, yeah, all the stats for Manny Fernandez, what he did over the course of his career was part of two Super Bowl teams, teams that went to three in a row. The only undefeated team, Will Fork couldn't get the, the help the Patriots to an undefeated season in the Super Bowl. And um, that's why I went, yeah, you know, I went with Manny. He, he had a, a, a very, very solid career. And, um, you know, that's why I went with Manny Fernandez. Okay. I, I think you convinced me. I, I'll put him on there. I'll take, I'll take Wolf Fork off and put him on there. Cause I think he, he's that important and realize he was uh, that key to the, those dolphins team. So sure, sure. Well, I mean, we have some uh, great players that we didn't even talk about that were 75. I mean, some of these guys, you know, like Lomas Brown and uh, uh, you know, Howard Ballard and Chris Hinton, um, Jerry Mays, uh, Tony Casillas, Tony Casillas, Earl Eatman. Yeah. I mean, there's some really, really good players, um, great players, and it's uh, – Yeah, they're probably good enough that a few of those we mentioned, they wear a different number in the 70s. They're probably on the top 10 list. Yeah, that's how good they are. It's just yeah. they're up the, – the competition level of, of Jersey 75 is – it's off the charts. Yeah. No, no doubt. I mean – Dave Purifoy, John Gordy, Brian Balaga. I mean, Ken Ruckers. And there's, 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 I mean, and then, you know, these guys that I'd have to go back and research too, that, um, yeah, there's some great, great number 75s 
who we didn't talk about. Yeah, we, we probably could have did a top 20 and had a lot of talk about, but, uh, you know, we'd be putting our, our listeners uh, would be, you know, driving their cars off of cliffs or something listeners <laughs> for two hours, you know, so we, uh, we have, we'll limit it to the 10 and uh, just acknowledge, you know, the, the substantial players that uh, didn't make the list and, you know, maybe some of them are still playing. I'm not sure. I think Balaga might still be playing this year. I, I think he's coming back this year and, uh, you know, maybe he'll do some things. Uh, that they win a Super Bowl or something. Maybe he gets uh, reconsidered. So yeah. who knows? Yeah. But the so, Lomas Brown, 18 seasons, we're not 75. That jumps right out at you, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then there was uh, another another decent giant down there, not not top 10 material, but really good, George Martin. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah, he played on that Super Bowl team, wasn't that? He the played first on the first Super Bowl Yeah, team. the Parcells. Super yeah, Bowl. the first one. And I think he might have had a sack in that game. Hmm. Very, very nice. Okay. Well, Hey, I uh, appreciate your time, uh, Warren. You know, once again, you have come through with uh, flying colors, uh, helping us find these Jersey number 75s and uh, appreciate the, the, the knowledge that you shared and the due diligence, uh, looking up all these statistics and stories and uh, sharing it with our, us and the listeners and uh, very interesting and a great job. Once again, thank you. Uh, my pleasure. I enjoyed doing it. Um, it's a lot of fun. And, and, you know, for you to go through ultimately 100 of these numbers from double zero to 99, pretty admirable. Good for you. Huh, well, thank you. It's, it's been fun to do it. Learned a lot, just like learning about, uh, you know, Manny today, Manny Fernandez, you know, can, you never have a day where you don't learn something, you know? So, and that's a, it's a great day when you do it, especially when it's football history. And, yep. uh, and uh, once again, I, th- I thank you for, for, all these episodes you've been on so far, and especially this number 75 that you just helped us with. And uh, and maybe we'll get you on for one or two more before we're done. Anytime, Darren, anytime. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to SportsHistoryNetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items. Plus, get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes.